Welcome to the 2022 Latinx Kidlit Book Festival. Please read our anti-harassment policy in the chat box. And don't forget to subscribe to the Latinx Kidlit Book Festival's YouTube channel. And if you are a school, a classroom, a librarian or educator joining us, please enter our classroom book set giveaway. You can find the link to the entry form in the chat. My name is Nonica Ramos, and I'm honored to be the moderator for our panel, Resistencia Viva, Writing Social Justice Kidlet. My debut picture book, Your Mama, illustrated by Jacqueline Alcantara, was a Kirkus Best Picture Book of 2021, School Library Journal Best Picture Book of 2021, and a National Council of English Teachers Notable Poetry Book. My picture book, Beauty Woke, illustrated by Paula Escobar, has earned star reviews from Booklist and Kirkus. One of my most special projects this past year as an educator was working in Aldean ISD, where I got to teach high school newcomers how to write story retellings. You can find out more about me and my books on my website, nonicaramos.com. And now for our panelists, I'm going to introduce you to Alda P. Dobbs. She is the author of the historical novels, Barefoot Dreams of Petra Luna. And well, I'll pause because I wanna see this beautiful book cover. Gorgeous. And the follow-up, The Other Side of the River. There you go. <laughs> beautiful. Her debut novel received a Porta Bell Prey honor and is a Texas Blue Bonnet Master List selection. Alda was born in a small town in Northern Mexico, but moved to San Antonio, Texas as a child. She studied physics and worked as an engineer before pursuing her love of storytelling. She's as passionate about connecting children to their past, their communities, different cultures and nature as she is about writing. Alda lives with her husband and two children outside Houston, Texas. Thank you so much, Alda, for being here. No, thank you, Noni, for moderating this in, uh, in Lanx Festival, Book Festival. Thank you for having me here. I'm very, very excited. Yes. And our next uh, panelist, Myra Cuevas. Myra is a CNN award-winning journalist and the author of the young adult novels, Does My Body Offend You? A Target YA Book Club selection and Salty Bittersweet. Her short story, Resilience, was published as part of the anthology, Foreshadow. Myra is also the co-founder of the Latinx Kidlick Book Festival and a loud and proud Puerto Rican. She keeps her sanity by practicing Buddhist meditation. She lives in Atlanta with her husband, her two stepsons, their fluffy cat, and a very loud chihuahua. You can find Myra on Instagram at myra.cuevas and her website, myracuevas.com. And maybe we can have a picture of Myra's book on the screen. Does my body offend you? Thank you so much. Thank you, Noni. I'm so excited about our conversation. Thank you, Myra, for being here. And our next panelist, Karina N. Gonzalez. She is a bilingual speech language pathologist at an elementary school in Brooklyn, New York, and author of the Kirkus Starred Picture Book, The Coquis Still Sing, Los Coquis Aun Cantan, which we have in our house right now, Roaring Brook Press 2022, and forthcoming picture book, The Churros Stand, El Carrito de Churros, from Cameron Kids 2024. Karina has an AAS in textile science from the Fashion Institute of Technology and an MS in speech language pathology from Brooklyn College. And Karina resides in Brooklyn, New York and Aguadilla, Puerto Rico. Welcome, Karina. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be here. I just wanted to show the cover of my book. Here. <laughs> Beautiful. So what I'm going to do now is to ask everyone to share just a little bit about what your books are about. And please feel free to hold up your book so that the audience can see the beautiful work. Um, if you know your illustrator, you can shout them out and then share a little bit about your book. I'm going to start with Alda. All right, well, my book, uh, Barefoot Dreams of Petra Luna, 
was inspired by my great grandmother, her story of escaping the Mexican Revolution back in 1913, and the trek she did across the desert with her family, which she nearly died there, and the struggles to get to America. And the second book follows the same character, uh, The Other Side of the River, follows Petra Luna, but now she's in Texas in a refugee camp, just like my great grandmother was in a refugee camp. And then it follows Petra Luna to San Antonio. I, I grew up in San Antonio, and in my research, I found out that a lot of refugees ended up in San Antonio. So I wanted to follow the character there and, and show how these immigrants, you know, how they struggled for resources because it was limited, and there's so many uh, immigrants. Uh, that, refugees uh, getting there to San Antonio. And I do want to give a shout out to the artist of both uh, book covers because they're gorgeous. And it's John J. Capway. He lives in uh, New York City. And um, yeah, I was very honored just because there's so much symbolism that he put into the into the art that is part of the story too. So to see that is just incredible. So thank you. Thank you, Alda. I'm absolutely in awe of what you've written and what you've contributed and what needs to be in every classroom. Um, I'm going to now move to Myra, whose books are also in my kitchen, Salty Bittersweet, <laughs> <laughs> and I have multiple copies. Myra, tell us about your book, the newest one, Does My Body Offend You? So Does My Body Offend You is co-written with my, my best friend and my critique partner of many years, Marie Marquardt. Um, we wanted to write a book about what happens after the protest. What happens when, you know, the shouts die down and everybody takes their signs home and how do, how do young people can affect real lasting change in working within systems of oppression? So we, we used uh, the topic of dress codes uh, because dress codes, uh, we know from many studies and a lot of research that we did that they unfairly target young girls, uh, women and people and marginalized people. Uh, most of, of, of the people who are the victims of dress codes are actually members of the black community and, and, and of other marginalizations. So we wanted to, we wanted to talk about finding your voice when you have been uh, a victim of, of, you know, of, of, a, um, of, of dress coding, uh, but also coming together as, as allies, you know, building a coalition, uh, learning when to listen to each other and when to take action um, and just explore all these these amazing things that um, are so timely right now, you know, we're in an era of social justice, of activism, um, and sometimes it's hard figuring out uh, where our place is in, in, in these movements. Thank you, Myra. And I absolutely love that you're dealing with after the protest, because it's important for us to depict the protests, but most of life is before and after. <laughs> absolutely, yes. absolutely. Yes, thank you. I want to now hear from Karina. Tell us all about your book. So I wrote this, uh, my debut picture book, The Coquillas Still Sing in Spanish, Los Coquillas Aún Cantan. This was written by me and illustrated by my brilliant friend, Crystal Quiles. And the Spanish version was translated by Amparo Ortiz and it was published by Roaring Brook Press. And yeah, this came out August 23rd, 2022. It's a story about how the resilience of Puerto Rico's flora and fauna mirrors the resilience of the Puerto Rican people that were all intertwined. And although the story is set in Puerto Rico, it's a universal story as people all around the world are experiencing climate disasters. So I hope people get to the opportunity to read the book and enjoy it. Uh, yes, and Karina, the book is stunning. The book is necessary. And, and in addition, the resources that you have in the back are incredible. So mm -hmm. I, I hope Thank that this so is- Yes, it, this is also a book that needs to be in, in, the, in, in every classroom. I'm going to just talk briefly about beauty um, because I think we all are so connected in our conversations right now and what it is that we're looking for. This book uh, is about a Puerto Rican girl who's loved by her family and her community, and she's awake to her beauty. She knows how beautiful she is, but 
Um, as she grows older, she's exposed to the constant things that all of our children are exposed to. The racism that comes through in, in our uh, firsthand experiences, the racism that comes through in the media and TV and every place that exists. And so what this book is about is how, how she's affected by that mentally and how our community comes together to help her heal. And so with that, we're going to get started and, and get ready to, to really center ourselves in these stories. Um, I'm going to ask every one of our panelists, all of us, to read from your work if you want to prepare now and turn to your page. Um, and I'm going to ask if you have a picture book like Karina and me, we have a couple of pages. And for our longer text, maybe one page, maybe depending on where you feel uh, it'll end uh, on a clear note. I'm going to um, give a heads up to Karina. I'm going to ask you first. And what I want you to do is to just read and let us all soak in the power of your words. And then after that, talk about your inspiration for your content, for your craft, and why you chose to, to start where you, you chose to start. So Karina, when you are ready. Thank you so much, Nanika. So I'm going to start with the beginning of the story. Here we see um, Elena on her rooftop plucking a mango from her tree in the backyard. Let's see if I can angle the book. <laughs> At sunup, I climb the ladder to the roof. From here, I am as tall as Abuela's mango tree. Its branches, heavy with fruit, reach out to say, hello. Hola, I reply, giving the branch a shake. Ripen mangoes rain down onto the garden with gentle fuzz. The mango tree gives us many gifts. When the sun is high, its leaves lend their cool shade. When I'm hungry, its fruit is the sweetest snack. And when night falls, a song fills the air. Goki, goki, goki. Hidden in the garden live the goki frogs. Luna runs in circles, barking and dancing to their tune. Goki, goki, oh, how I love thee. I sing back. You sound just like your mother, Abuela says. Suddenly, a strong wind blows, lifting the goki song away. So this story begins um, with the main character, Elena. She's on her rooftop plucking mangoes from her, her backyard mango tree. And you see her little perrita luna, if I can angle this properly. <laughs> um, and I picked, I picked this scene to start the book at because when I was a young kid, um, I, I too would go up to my grandmother's rooftop and climb a little ladder and pluck mangoes from her tree. And I felt that this scene would really help orient the reader as to where she is and what um, and how and what Puerto Rico looks like. It's very tropical, it's very lush, because that would help um, the reader understand later on when the hurricane passes and that the colors are not as saturated. And so I decided to start it here. And then and on this page, we see um, the cookies for the first time. And how important they are to Puerto Rican culture and how they're basically our, our little lullaby at night. Thank you, Karina. I think it's so beautiful that you centered in the joy and understanding the power of the culture um, first. And I want to go to now to hear more beautiful words. Um, Alda, I love the cookies, those cookies. I was just like, I was missing. I was so homesick when you started playing the cookies. <laughs> Yeah, the same, Myra. I, I actually, my kids sleep to the sound of cookies in their room, so I know that's when they're they're in their dream states, when I hear them through the doors. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> yeah. Okay, Alba, I, I, well, I knew this was going to be an emotional listening to all of you. Share with us your, your words. Sure. I'm going to share a part of uh, the other side of the river. And what I'm sharing here is when, because in the book, Beta's already in the United States, and she has a mentor and it's an Irish nun, an older lady who comes into her life. And she takes her pretty much, takes Petra under her wing and realizes that Petra has a dream to learn how to read and write and just become aware you know, of books and stuff like that. And she guides Petra through that. So at one point, she introduces Petra to books that talk about planets and stuff like that. And of course, I bring that into the story because my background is in physics and I, you know, I love planets. I love all that stuff. And I... Petra, I think, would have loved the same stuff as, as I did, of course. But um, So I read this part when she learns a little bit of astronomy, and then she shares that with her family. 
That evening, as I helped Abuelita and Camila with dinner, I told them all I learned about planets, comets, and stars. I told them about La Via Lactea, the Milky Way, and how it got its name. Emilia sat on a chair with Luisito on her lap. Nina, sitting across from them, fed Luisito spoonful, spoonfuls of arroz con leche while sneaking one for herself every now and then. I'd made Amelia promise me not to ask any questions until I was done talking, but her feet twitched and jittered in anticipation. As I continued to talk, Camila gasped and gave me wide-eyed glances as if I were chatting the juiciest gossip ever. Abuelita, on the other hand, shook her head and crossed herself constantly as if I were sharing nothing but bad news. I never knew the earth spun, said Camila. No wonder I feel so dizzy sometimes. In my excitement, I continued to talk, and then I said something I probably should have saved for later. I talked about a man named Darwin, and when I tried to explain evolution, Abuelita almost dropped the big pot of chicken mole. Who in God's name is putting those ridiculous ideas in your head, said Abuelita. They're not ridiculous ideas, Abuelita, I said. It's all real. It's in the books. Senora, Camila turned to Abuelita. Petra's brain is growing. That's a good thing. Abuelita's face grew red. Esas son cosas del diablo. Those are works of the devil. She immediately crossed herself three times and whispered a prayer because the word devil had escaped her lips. What if Sister Nora found out about the things you're saying, Abuelita said, about your talk of monkeys and nonsense? Imagine how upset she'd be. I remained quiet. My plan had backfired. I waited that didn't become less fearful. Instead, she was upset. I believe my mind was full of evil inklings. And then it continues at the end when she's about to take in her brother and sisters to bed. And Amelia wants to find out more about planets. So Amelia scooted toward Luisito, making room for me to lie next to her. I began telling her about the earth, the sun, and the moon. I would start slow, but eventually I wanted to teach her and Luisito everything I knew. With all my heart, I believed every time we learned something new, we were one step closer to clearing our lives of ghosts, superstitions, and fears. So, so that's uh, trying, because I, I've always liked learning. I've always been, a, a, my heart's been in learning. So if I could be in school all day, I, I'd be there, you know, learning languages, learning science, anything I could get my hands on. So I, I put that uh, desire in Petra because like my, grandmother, my grandmother's dream was to learn how to read and write. So I put that same dream in, in Petra. So powerful. Thank you so much, Alda. Thank you. Myra, you ready to? That is, that is so beautiful. Is, <laughs> these are so uh, two beautiful, hard stories to follow. <laughs> um, if you could please put the cover of That's My Body of Any. Th thank you so much. And I, I want to give a shout out to Camila Rosa. She is um, a Brazilian uh, a artist and activist who designed our beautiful cover. So I'm going to read from the first chapter of the book, and I'm going to I'm going to jump around a little bit because of due to time. Okay, uh, chapter one. This is from Malena's point of view. The book is written from Malena and, and Ruby's point of view. Ruby was it's Marie's character. Um, I'm not a superstitious person, but my abuela Milagros says catastrophes come in threes. I'm starting to believe she's onto something. First came this beast of a hurricane called Maria, which caused our island more devastation that we can mentally process. Mommy and I are now stranded in the swampland that is Florida, our second stroke of bad luck. The only upside is I get to hang out with my cousins every day instead of just once, once or twice a year. And now, because irony is Lady Fortuna's weapon of choice, thanks to those very cousins, my mala suerte trifecta may be complete. How do I avert this third disaster lo looming over me before it wrecks what's left of my life? I reach for the medal of La Virgencita hanging around my neck, which Abuela says protects me from the mal de ojo. A cold chill runs down my spine as I step back from the full-length mirror attached to my bedroom. I don't know which sight is more pitiful, my reflection or the mishmash of secondhand furnishings around me. 
mostly donations from a local church drive for Maria evacuees. This is bad. The skin on my back has gone from brown to angry red, the color of a Caribbean lobster that's just been pulled from a pot of scalding water. It turns out bathing suits make for terrible landscaping apparel. So now she she explains that basically she got the sunburn because she was helping. She got in trouble with her tia um, or her cousins got her in trouble with her tia. So she had to do all this landscaping work. She got a sunburn and now she can't wear a bra to school. She's getting ready for school. I bet Carlos, my her cousin. I bet Carlos slept like a baby last night. Not me. I barely slept at all. Lying on my stomach was pure torture, thanks to the two mountains that have recently risen from my chest. No one told me that double D really stands for doble dolor, double the pain. Where did these things come from anyway? Besides Soraida, I don't know how many other 15-year-olds that have to shop for big bust bras. My abuela says that the Rosario women were all blessed with the precious gift of tetas grandes, a clear sign of our female strength, she reassures me. Wear them proudly, she loves to say, but this morning they feel more like an enormous inconvenience than a gift. Thank you. That was, I, I had to, <laughs> there's so many humorous and moments in there. And I want to point out, listen to the diversity in all of our approaches. Mm -hmm. and that's part of what we're talking about here at the festival, that there's power in humor. There's power in poetry. There's power in science and all the different approaches everyone is taking here today. Mara, did you want to talk a little bit about um, just your choice for what you share today before we, we go on to our next question? Uh, yes. So, God, there's so much I could, I could talk for the whole session about this. <laughs> so, you know, I wanted to show with that with that opening scene. I, I wanted to show where Melena uh, was at. Right. This this is the day that everything changes. Mm -hmm. um, she this this sunburn is going to set off a series of of, of, of events. Uh, that is going to change her life completely. By the end of the book, she's not going to be this girl who is scared and freaked out because she has to go to school without a bra. And, you know, we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but that opening scene is so important because you really want the reader to understand um, where uh, where is the main character? What is the world of the main character? What are they afraid of? What are their dreams? Um, and you just want to jump in on this journey with them from, from page one. Thank you. Thank you so much for illuminating that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to read quickly a couple of pages um, from Beauty Woke, and these particular pages are going to lead us into our next question as well. Um, Karina, I, you... <laughs> I'll do my best. I don't know if I'll do as well as you did with holding the book up. This is the challenge. <laughs> um, so I, I think that'll do. So from Beauty Woke, page one, beauty sleeps in the dark is where it starts. First, there is one heart, then two, one day something new, little conch shell ears to hear, watercolor words drawing near like estas palabras, Sueño, hecho, realidad, love, hope, felicidad. But from la doctora, words of alarm. Not even babies safe from harm. Keep beauty close, the world ain't woke. She said they got spells, words that devour. They'll sentence her to sleep and take her power. And I want to start there because I want to start with where we are in this festival, with our strengths, with our family, with our community. I think that it's important to read it. We all are coming from that point, whether we're finding that in our biological families or our found families, we start with our power. But we and our children are facing a lot of issues regardless of our strengths and our gifts. So I want to ask all of the panelists here, in this world that requires this resistance against sexism, against colonization, cultural erasure, colorism, white supremacy, our youth are especially vulnerable. So if you could take some time to describe your protagonist's mental health journey as they struggle to be seen and heard and resist the status quo. 
and take a little bit of time to tell us how can children like your protagonist be supported? So uh, I want to start with this question. I'm going to begin with Myra. And after that, I'm going to go to Karina and Alda just to let you know um, as you prepare. Um, Myra, talk to us a little bit about the mental health journey of your protagonist. Yeah, so Malena's journey is is very personal to me. Malena gets stuck in Florida after Hurricane Maria Pomos the island in Puerto Rico. She was visiting her family and her parents have decided that they're not going back, that they're staying in Florida and they're starting a new life. But her dad is still in Puerto Rico working for FEMA. So we all we all know especially that you know the, the diaspora the puerto rican diaspora that was living in the states when hurricane maria went through the island and caused this devastation unlike anything we had seen before it was such a time of despair um me like i i was not able to reach my family for over a month after the hurricane and every day i felt that anxiety of hoping that that would be the day when I could talk to my mom, where I could talk to my abuela, where I could talk to my aunts and my uncle and my cousins um, and just hear that my loved ones were OK. So I wanted to tell a story where where that that was a central aspect to to the story um, and to the struggle of this character. Right. She's now she's Puerto Rican. She loved her life in Puerto Rico. Now she finds herself living in Florida and, uh, and, 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 you know, she's seen the destruction in her homeland and trying to figure out how to, um, how to reconcile the new life with the life that she left behind. Um, also when, when Malena resettles in Florida, she loses her sense of self and her voice. Um, and this is something that that was very much part of me, my experience. Um, I moved to the States when I was 22. Um, you know, Malena, like me, she was worried about her accent. You know, sometimes when she gets nervous, like she forgets certain words um, and she's struggling to navigate the rules of this of, of the life in the States, which at times can feel very transactional, you know, back home in Puerto Rico, she knew where everything was. She knew her community. Uh, now she's she's having to learn all these all these things. So I was already living in the States for 10 years and, and speaking mostly English, uh, surrounded by people from all over the world, uh, because Atlanta is very a very cosmopolitan city when I decided that I wanted to start this journey of writing books. Um, and at that time, it was I felt like I was reliving again uh, that time of, of moving back, you know, moving, changing from Puerto Rico to the States and entering the world of publishing. I struggled with what language to write in. Right. Do I write in Spanish? Do I write in English? Like what story do I want to tell? And and at first I, I struggled to find my voice uh, because I realized that it had been diluted because I had I'd spent so much time away from the island. So this was another, a second journey of, of self-discovery. Thank you. Um, I <laughs> so, Such a powerful thing for us to consider as our kids come into our libraries and our classrooms, that, that, that this is all within them. And you know, if we are experiencing these things as adults, imagine what our youth are experiencing. Um, Karina, can you share a little bit about the mental health journey of your protagonist? Sure, very similar to what Mayra was saying about Hurricane Maria and Puerto Rico. You know, Puerto Rico, where my story is set, is a colony of the United States. And therefore, Boricuas are forever marked within that reality, even Boricuas living in the diaspora, right? So right now, as we speak, um, Hurricane, I guess now at this point, Fiona is passing through the archipelago nearly five years to the day of Hurricane Maria. And it's important that we all understand that colonialism exacerbates climate disaster. So this question that you're asking, Namika, is especially prescient. Um, the main character of my story, Elena, um, and um, she's a young girl, and she's living in Puerto Rico with her papi, her abuelo, and her little brother, Benito, who's actually lovingly named after Benito Antonio Martinez, who's also known as Bad Bunny. Um, you know, something like six in 10 children in Puerto Rico live below the poverty line, and the illustrations in the story created by Crystal Quiles hint at hint that, that her and her family share in that experience. And in the story, I take her, uh, I take the reader on an emotional journey, including 
the sorrow of never saying goodbye to some of her friends who moved away following the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. I mean, also, there's a line in my book, um, my school's doors are closed forever, yet my teachers taught me that books can open any door. And so with me saying that, I'm trying to convey that resistance can also look like feeding your mind with knowledge or growing a garden of veggies in your backyard. You know, resistance can look like many things. I, I love how these narratives are coming together in the fact that we're thinking about what is life like before the protests and after, what it is, the, the mental health journeys of these, these students, and the fact that resistance comes in many different forms. And exploring those forms helps our children heal and finding what's best fit for them um, as they go on those journeys. Alda, you want to talk to us about your protagonist? Sure. My protagonist, Petra Luna, a lot of people compare her to Esperanza and Esperanza Rising because it's a story of immigration, except that Petra Luna starts with nothing. I mean, because uh, I think in Esperanza, she's, you know, well-to-do, comes from a well-to-do family. But Petra, like my grandmother, my great-grandmother, there was nothing, you know, barely stuff to eat. They, they wore ragged clothes, they were barefoot all the time. And those are stories that were passed down to me. And also the, the injustices were the ones that they suffered from the rich, you know, the discrimination uh, from the, the society, the, the, the ones who had the, the money, the power. But despite the oppression, my grandmother and great grandmother always saw themselves as survivors. You know, they never saw themselves as victims. So that's something that I want to put in my books, portray in my characters. That they're fighters. They have grit. And, you know, they're not going to feel, you know, sorry about themselves. It's always fighting and we're survivors. So that's something I want to put in my characters. And, and the reason or something I I feel that as myself as an immigrant too, coming into this country, that I think that helps kids like this is opportunities, you know, give them a chance, give them an opportunity and they'll embrace it, you know, because we're at least where I came from, there was none. So now that I'm in this country, I've been given so much. And I, I mean, I studied physics, I joined the military, I've traveled the world, I wrote two books, you know, and it couldn't have happened where, where I came from. So, but I was given that opportunity because those opportunities exist in this country. And I'm just grateful, you know, to, that, to have that. So yeah, for kids like this, opportunities, you know, I'm sure they'll, they'll embrace them. And it's absolutely important to understand opportunities when we're looking at schools and resources and where those resources are going to and where they're most, most of the time not schools of color, communities of color, marginalized kids, the, these, the opportunity that they need is their educations and their choice in their education. So that's so important, Alda. I want to go on to <clears throat> our next question. Um, I'm going to read a couple of lines from Beauty to lead us to that, because I want to talk about the mental health journey of beauty. And the page that I'm going to show you is a mural by Paula Escobar. And uh, the words that are on this, I know that you probably can't see them but very clearly, but they're illegal ban cage 4,645, which indicates an estimated number of the deaths of people in Puerto Rico from the hurricane, not just from the actual hurricane, but from the neglect and the lack of resources given to the Puerto Rican people to reconstruct and heal and take care of themselves. And the other words are border and hate. <clears throat> and the words of the book are, but no matter where beauty turned, the palabras cut, burned. Beauty ran home, drew the shades, her heart ached. She fell asleep, didn't dream. It's so important to understand that these, these uh, situations that these kids are going through are sometimes situations happening when their child childhood more than an entire lifetime that some of us experience um, in loss. But what we're doing with the Latinx Book Festival and all of these stories is overcoming narratives that the tragedy is who we are. We overcome the racist narratives by having Latinx stories told by Latinx creators as the dominant narrative. We need more books, more TV shows, more books translated. As Myra was talking about the importance of language, her book should be translated so that it is in both languages or more languages. Um, when we talk about the mirrors, windows, and doors, we, that image that we have, the only way to make that image unbreakable is to make it so that these kids have access to all this knowledge all the time. So I wanna go back to these beautiful books and I wanna ask you all, I, I know it's very difficult, but if you could think of three words to exemplify your book, and I want you to imagine it like the mural that Paula Escobar created, but of joy or things that are real that your character's experiencing, period, because that's the reality. 
Um, what would be on that mural? What would be the three words that are kind of shouted from your book? Um, going to start with you, Karina, and uh, tell us your, your words. I would choose hope, community, and autonomy. Absolutely beautiful. And I'm picturing those words on this giant mural. Okay, so Myra, what would be the words that would be on the mural of your book? Badass, <laughs> bodies, and compassion. Um, badass because it takes some badassery to raise your voice and speak up. Bodies because we need to resist the policing, politicizing, and victimization of female bodies and bodies of people uh, from marginalized communities. And compassion because in this movement for change, we should consider calling each other in instead of calling each other out. Thank you, Myra. And I want everyone who's sitting in the audience to think about this also as an opportunity when you're in the classroom to think about these books, Karina's book, and what words the, the, your students pull out and to ask them why they've chosen those words and to ask your artists to illustrate them. Um, Alda, what are your three words? All right. For me, the three words would be history, grit, and universal. And history is because of the family stories that we have to seek these family stories and continue because we, we grow stronger when we know our family stories and grit. Like I mentioned before, you know, we have to be fighters, you know, we're, we're survivors, not victims. Don't, don't, you know, I, I don't like that victim mentality. You see yourself as a survivor, you fight. And that's what Petra Luna does. That's what our characters do. They fight and universal because these stories are don't Petra Luna doesn't only apply to my family or Mexicans. It's a universal story. That's why I have, Sister Nora, the Irish nun, because she brings her backstory of escaping Ireland during the famine. And even though it was a struggle to get to this country, you get to this country and there's still struggles. So it's all universal, you know, theme that just transcends times and periods and all that and cultures. Thank you, Alda. And Karina, I'm going to come back to you for a minute before I share my three words. I loved your word autonomy. So I wondered if you could just say us a little bit about that word. Yeah, autonomy meaning um, a community being able to rely on themselves because when Hurricane Maria happened, I saw that my grandmother had to, her and her neighbors had to figure things out for themselves that they realized fairly quickly that no government organization or anyone was going to, you know, come in and swoop in and, you know, um, meet all their needs. So. The idea that a community will come together and um, um, band together and resolve their needs themselves is central to this story. Thank you so much. Um, what, with Beauty Woke, the first three words that I thought of were community, family, matriarchs um, in the family, because it wasn't just the abuelita, the tias are there, the godmothers are there, but I, I changed it. And I think it sums up all the things that we're talking about to we got us, my three words, because we got, listen to what we have here. We've got the gifts, we've got the resilience, we've got the strength and, and we deserve the resources, but we have to understand how much is present within ourselves and our community to help build and to help strengthen and take care of our kids. And that's what this is all about. Everything that we're here about today, this festival is about our children and our youth. And we have to get them and we can because we have within us those talents. We have the teachers, we have the physicists, the engineers, we have the speech language pathologists. We've got us, we've got the CNN journalists. Look at what's here. So um, I wanna go on now and, 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 and keeping in mind, of course, our time, because as always, we could devote hours to each of these lovely <laughs> authors, but we have a short amount of time. So share one to two facts that I really want you to focus on resonating with our readers that they should know when, when they read your book or that is background for your book that's essential for them to explore in the classroom or on their own, because we know our kids are also researchers. Um, Alba, let me start with you. What's something super important that our students and our teachers should listen to and, and look into further? Something that uh, I realize is that the Mexican, the impact the Mexican Revolution had on, on the United States, and people don't realize that, that 2 million refugees ended up in this country after that Mexican revolution. And that changed the Southwest of the United States forever. And it's something I wish we, we spoke about more. And the second one was the, the refugee camps, you know, the, like the one my great grandmother was in. 
Uh, something she always liked to talk about was that those five weeks when she was at the refugee camp, she'd never eaten so well in her entire life. She said that every family was given a pound of sugar, a pound of corn, flour, one whole chicken every single day. And she was just so thankful and grateful for America for having given her refuge and having treated her so well at the, at the camp. Thank you, Alda. And Karina? Sure, so I wanna mention that over 100,000 homes were destroyed uh, following the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. And in my book, um, the last scene you see that the, the house um, does, does, doesn't have a roof, that it has a blue tarp for a roof. And if you go to Puerto Rico today, you'll actually still see homes with this blue tarp. And it's been um, five years now on Tuesday. Um, I know this this episode is going to air in October, but it's a, this is during the time when Hurricane Maria happened five years ago. And I just want to draw um, educators' eyes to the back matter of the book. Nika, you also mentioned this, that um, there's a lot more facts um, that I share and context that educators and families can look at before or after they read the book. Thank you. Myra? Yeah, so the you know one of the bigger themes of does my body offend you is body autonomy, especially the body autonomy of girls, women, and marginalized people, which which we know right now is it's it's under attack. Um, you know what what I feel is at stake is the right of all girls and women to wield control over their bodies, a right that is eroded daily in classrooms across across the country. In schools everywhere, discriminatory dress codes have become a means to further oppress girls and marginalized communities under the guise of an education of a of an educational institution. Uh, school officials sometimes define girls' bodies as offensive, sexy, provoking, problematic, and inappropriate. Mundane body parts are sexualized and weaponized. And how are girls going to gain the right for body autonomy as women if the bodies are being objectified and devalued by the institutions they're told to trust? How will they develop the capacity to fight back? And I recently wrote an opinion piece uh, for CNN uh, talking about this in, in more length. I, I would like to encourage uh, everyone watching to go and read it. Thank you, Myra. And I want to kind of bring attention to all the people out there who have the power and the gift and the privilege of teaching, reading to children, interacting with our, with our youth. They're not just carrying the weight of these backpacks, they're carrying the weight of these evolving stories of understanding that include great trauma. And I want to make sure and say that they include great trauma because it's so important as we've listened to Karina, Alda, and Myra, that that is not all that who they are, but it is what they carry. So we have to keep that in mind that even a child who comes from a loving family where everything's intact and holding, yes, that, that is definitely true in many levels. They're still carrying this. Even the healthiest child is coming into that door with these needs, mental health needs needing to be addressed. And Puerto Rican history and Mexican history and all the diversity of all of our Latinx identity is all that is affecting every Latinx child walking into the room. Puerto Rico is relevant to every child in there. Mexico is relevant to every child in there and so forth and so on. I want to ask as a, a question to wrap up here um, before we go on to wonderful student questions. Your protagonist's greatest wish, if you could tell me in one or two sentences, if they had a wish and it came true, what would it be? And I'm going to start with Alda. My protagonist wants you to learn how to read and write and have her family safe. So just being able to go to school, you know, sit in a classroom, learning and knowing that her family's safe at home, that would be perfect for her. And wouldn't that be perfect for all of our kids to know that, to know that they have a good school with resources and well-paid teachers who look like them in the classrooms, benefiting everybody. Thank you so much, Alda. Karina, what is your, your character, I can't, one of their wishes? That she would get to be a kid and do kid things like playing with her brother or her doggy Luna, free from the worries that should be shouldered by adults, not children. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, Karina. And and Myra, what would be your characters? Yeah, so my Lena's wish is my wish is to live in a world where 
girls and women's and other marginalized people and their bodies are respected, accepted, valued, and seen as a positive symbols of our communities and our ancestry, a world where body autonomy is a birthright. Absolutely wonderful. And I want everyone who is listening and watching to please check out further information on Karina, Myra and other because I could definitely not do justice to all the topics that their books address and how they benefit not just Latina children, not just BIPOC children, but all children. We all benefit from truth. These histories are not stagnant, they are living histories. And the way that we come out of this all together as one united country and people is by embracing the truth. And that's what there is present in these books. And now we get to go to listen to our students who have amazing questions. So if we could go to those questions and then I will ask our panelists to answer. What are some of your toughest struggles as an author slash illustrator? Karina? My toughest struggle is having time to be creative. I have a full-time job. I work in a school, in an elementary and middle school. and that really consumes my time and my energy. And I want to do well in my job. I want to give my students my all and finding time in the day to write um, or um, go to book events or anything related to the book is, is probably one of the most challenging aspects that I've been experiencing. But that isn't deterring me from actually writing. It's just a matter of managing my time and making sure that I'm somehow carving um, some time to, to be creative. Thank you, Karina. I think all the students can also identify with balancing, <laughs> balancing time to be creative and to do their schoolwork and everything else. Let's have our next question from uh, Maya. Why did you choose to write in the form and genre that you did? Oh, wow. Wow. All right, so I'm gonna answer and Maya's right, it's my turn. Just want to make sure. Okay, thank you, Maya. That's a great question. Uh, the reason I chose this genre, historical fiction, is because it's a way I could communicate part of uh, my family history through this uh, fiction. Because I, I think history is important, especially family stories, because there's a lot of history that repeats itself, things that happen over and over again. And the only way we better prepare or even avoid those things is if we know what's happened before, because we could expect it to happen again. My presentations, I show before and after pictures of the Mexican Revolution and of recent ones. And you see that same crisis in the border. You see people escaping homeland violence. You see people in refugee camps. Right now we have COVID. Back then they had smallpox. So history happens again and again. So it's great for people to be aware and also to let people know the different histories that are not mentioned in schools, like my great grandmother escaping Mexico or the Germans when they were abandoned in the Gulf Coast in Texas and all the struggles people had in order to survive in this country. Thank you. And Myra, this next question is for you. So let's bring our question from Gabriela. How do you write a character who isn't like you? I love that question. That's such a great question, Gabriela from seventh grade, Utah. Um, so normally what I do is I, I try to find an entry point um, and you know, what, what, like, what do I and this character have in common? You know, is it, um, is it a mental health struggle? Is it a family tie? Um, is it a place, uh, within society or, 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 or a way the character views the world? So I, I will try to connect with this, with this character in some way. And then the other thing that I do is I do a lot of research as a journalist. I believe in the power of research. I believe that research, um, it, research makes our storytelling a lot richer. Um, it, it just brings everything, the, the, our communities to life. It also um, prompts in different parts of our imagination. And, and we go in directions that we probably didn't think of originally. Um, you know, normally when, when I am preparing to write a book, I spend a lot of time reading what other people have written about this topic. Um, I will do, I will do a lot of interviews. Uh, if I can, I will try to visit the location. For example, right now I'm working on another book, uh, that I'm co-writing with Marie. It is a Romeo and Juliet 
set in retail set in the mountains of Puerto Rico in Barranquitas, Puerto Rico. I am so excited about this book. And Maria and I actually spent a week in Puerto Rico interviewing people in the town, um, interviewing singers of Trova, the the you know a very folkloric music in Puerto Rico eating in different places, taking notes of the food, uh, writing down all these notes from the characters. And then when we sat down to write, the scenes were so rich because we had we had so much material uh, to work with. And even uh, there, there are several in the characters that I would probably never like would be friends with because some of them are just mean. <laughs> but I would I still had that point. I still found that point of connection with them. Perfect, 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 perfect. So I want to thank F Fiana from seventh grade, New Jersey. I want to thank again Ma Maya, tenth grade from New York, and I want to thank Gabriella, seventh grade from Utah, because we this is what we're here for. We're here for you. We're here for your connection with you. Again, please check out all of these writers, uh, teachers, educators. Check out their websites. They have information on them for how to use these books in the classroom. And our message, to everyone, is these books are universal. These books are gifts. To everyone, thank you for attending the panel Resistencia Viva, Writing Social Justice Kidlet at the Latinx Book Festival. My name is Elizabeth Acevedo. I'm the author of Inheritance, a visual poem. And today I'm gonna share some tips on what it's like to write a poem that you wanna share with the world and perform on stage. And the kinds of things you might want to keep in mind as you start rehearsing and preparing for a performance of your poem so that you just uh, feel super confident on stage when you get there. I'm also going to recite my own poem so you can get a little taste of what it's like. Some people tell me to fix my hair. And by fix, they mean straighten. They mean whiten. But how do you fix this shipwrecked history of hair? The true meaning of stranded, when trusses hug tight like African cousins in ship bellies. Do they imagine their great grandchildren would look like us and would try to escape them how we do? trying to find ways to erase them out of our skin, to iron them out of our hair. This wild tangle of hair that strangles air. You call them wild curl. I call them breathing and descendants spiraling. Can you see them in this wet hair that waves like hello? And yo, they say Dominicans do the best hair. We can wash, set, flatten the spring in any lock. But what they mean is we're the best at swallowing amnesia. In a cup of morir soñando, die dreaming. We'd rather do that than live in this reality caught between orange juice and milk, between reflections of the sun and whiteness. What they mean is, why would you date a black man? What they mean is, a prieto cocolo. What they mean is, why would two oppressed people come together? It's two times the trouble. What they really mean is, have you thought of your daughter's hair? So I have a few tips on how to find your inspiration. The very first one is if you want to be a writer, you kind of have to walk through the world as a writer, which means whenever you're looking around you, you're thinking, where is there an image I could write down? Or, oh, I just heard something. Um, would that be an interesting piece of dialogue? Or when you see something incredibly beautiful, you think to yourself, how would I describe this to someone else? So you're constantly in a state of, um, of taking in information. The poet Kava Akbar calls it being permeable, right? And I think that that's really the truth of, of what it's like to look for inspiration is you're just letting it kind of soak in at all times, but you have to trust that you're the writer at all times and you're looking at the world in that way. Some other tips, because I said there were gonna be a few more. <laughs> 
I think that you have to find the piece of art that inspires you, that you're trying to make or imitate, right? And so if you're a writer, you kind of have to have maybe one or two books that you're able to turn to, that you say, on my days when I'm completely stuck and I can't think anymore, there's this, you know, Renee Watson book that I know I can go to because it's really gonna spark um, my creative energy. Or you know what, I'm gonna look at an art exhibit online because I think that looking at some visual art will really move me to think about my own language and my own writing, right? And so that's a really great tip and something that I do all the time when I feel kind of just like my creative well is dry, is I look at what are other artists doing? Who am I in conversation with? And can I find inspiration from them? So two tips for writing when you're actually trying to get a poem out. One, I'm going to suggest that folks really show themselves a lot of grace. A first draft of anything kind of sucks, right? And nobody likes to look at their own work when it sucks, but you really have to be mindful of, I am making something that has never been made and I'm going to be really gentle with it and with myself as I try to translate what's in my head onto a piece of paper, right? And so the first thing is just to forgive yourself and the draft for how bad it's gonna be, right? The second thing that I would say about getting a poem out of your body and onto a piece of paper is that it's okay if the poem is in response to an exercise, right? When we watch athletes, we don't think that they just pull up on game day and they're just like going at it, right? And making every shot. You have to work out, you have to exercise. And so if you're stuck at getting something out of your head, doing a writing prompt or a writing exercise or going online and trying to find like, what's a question I could respond to that might help me get some of what I'm feeling out is a great thing to do, right? And there's no shame in something having to be prompted for you to get your art across. So let's say you've already written a poem that you know you wanna say out loud. Here are two tips that I think would be helpful as you start thinking about performance that we don't often really talk about in the spoken word community. And the first one is take a deep breath before you even walk on stage, right? The moment you walk on stage, people are looking at you and you're on. But you taking that moment to just like inhale, remind yourself what you're about to do and why you're about to do it, and then exhale is so important to just have a ritual for like every time I go on stage, this is how I make sure that I'm grounded, yeah? And then the second thing I would say is you really wanna make sure that you're in control of the poem. When you get on a stage and you're saying a poem out loud, your body might freak out. You might start shaking, your legs are shaking, you might feel like you're drawn to tears because all of a sudden you're saying this out loud for the first time or even the second, third time. And so I would just suggest that you feel really comfortable with the subject matter and that you've practiced it enough that you can say, regardless of whether someone's heckling or whether someone laughs in the middle of it or whether or not I have a flashback to something, I'm safe and I trust myself within this text. Thank you all so much for watching and listening to my tips on feeling inspired, writing and performing spoken word. I hope that when you sit down or you walk on stage, you feel super comfortable with what you're about to say out loud.